Hello everyone, welcome to session six of LTech 676. I thought we'd start this week off having a little fun by testing out ChatGPT. By now you've probably heard about ChatGPT, which is OpenAI's artificial intelligence chatbot. GPT stands for Generative Pre-Trained Transformer, which is a fancy way of saying that the chatbot uses a language model trained to produce new text in a very natural and flexible way. So let's see what kind of answers ChatGPT can produce regarding questions related to LTEC 676. The first question I asked ChatGPT was, what's the difference between equity and equality? Here's how ChatGPT responded. Equity refers to fairness and justice in terms of outcomes, while equality refers to treating everyone the same, regardless of their circumstances or needs. Equity recognizes that different people may need different levels of support or resources to achieve the same outcome, while equality assumes that everyone starts from the same place and has the same needs. In other words, equity is about addressing systemic barriers and ensuring that everyone has an equal chance to succeed, while equality is about treating everyone the same without considering their unique circumstances or challenges. Not too shabby. How would you rate this response? Would you give it a thumbs up or a thumbs down? Next, I decided to probe on the topic of systemic barriers by asking ChatGPT, what is a systemic barrier? Here's ChatGPT's response. A systemic barrier is a barrier that is built into the structure or systems of a society, organization, or institution. These barriers can be intentional or unintentional and can prevent individuals or groups from accessing resources, opportunities, or services. I won't read the rest, but I think you get the idea. And again, how would you rate this response? Thumbs up or thumbs down? While we could probably spend a whole semester discussing ChatGPT and its implications, I thought it'd be fun to take a look at how this emerging technology might help or hinder our ability to understand the social and ethical issues of educational technology. For example, how do you think ChatGPT would respond if asked, Do you think you are a systemic barrier? Food for thought, and who knows? Maybe some of you will even test out ChatGPT to find out how it answers that question. Moving on, I'd like to talk about critical reflection for analyzing a metaphor. For this assignment, you had to contemplate all the possible meanings of this illustrated metaphor. The purpose, of course, was to help us think about the role educational technology is playing and should play in achieving the two dimensions of educational equity, fairness and inclusion. I enjoyed your reflections and thought most of you did a nice job of connecting to the course videos, the course readings, and your own personal experience. Our discussion thread synthesizers, Shana and Jennifer, helped shine a light on several of the themes to emerge from your reflection videos. In her analysis, Shana noticed that the class's interpretations of the graphic metaphor centered not only on access to, the use of, and the outcomes of educational technology in schools, but on education in general. A big part of that was who is making decisions about our education system and the difficulties of disenfranchised schools in keeping up with changes. Another observation noted by Shana was the fact that the larger outcome focused on by many of you was how to achieve an equitable education for all. And some of you felt that was represented in the graphic by being able to see the game, tearing down the fence, actually playing the game, or being able to sit in the stands and enjoy the game. Jennifer also made a number of insightful observations. As part of her synthesis of your work, Jen noted an undercurrent of wondering about who is making the decisions about the right direction to head in and what's best for learners. She wondered, even with access to the game, are we truly prepared with the proper tools to help guide our students? A fair question in an ever-changing technological world. And yet another observation 
Jen pointed out the theme of technology being a resource to improve instruction as well as a means to address equity. Of course, this all hinged on if it is available and accessible to everyone. Finally, Jen picked up on the notion that technology is not a solution, but more of a tool. She reminded us that while technology promotes equity, other factors need to be considered, or it can just become a cover over what's truly going on. So excellent work, Jennifer, Shana, and the rest of the class. I hope you enjoyed Critical Reflection for Analyzing a Metaphor. And with that, let's move on. Last week, we left off talking about the two dimensions of equity in education, fairness and inclusion. And we contemplated how technology is impacting both of those dimensions. So I want you to keep that in mind as we move forward to talk about some of the points raised in the Darling Hammond 2007 article. Now, Darling Hammond shares with us the U.S. results by subgroup on the 2003 Program in International Student Assessment, also known as the PISA. Let's take a look at how the U.S. does, on average, compared with the other 35 countries included in the PISA assessment. And that's labeled as the OECD. And of course, OECD stands for the Organizations for Economic Cooperation and Development which helps administer and oversee the PISA assessment. So here we can see that the U.S. is pretty close to average in reading, a little bit lower in science, a little bit lower in math, and, and considerably lower in problem solving. But what's important when thinking about educational equity and equality is thinking about how different subgroups within the United States fair in these four domains, reading, science, math, and problem solving. So here we can see how whites, Asians, and multiracial subgroups perform in reading. Notice that it's higher than the OECD average, as well as the U.S. total. Here we see how Hispanics and Blacks perform on reading. We see a similar pattern in science as we do with math and as we do with problem solving. Now, the data in the Darling Hammond article was a bit dated, so I just wanted to share with you some of the findings from the 2015 PISA, which states that the U.S. performed around average in science and reading, but below average in mathematics. 11% of the variation in student performance in science could be attributed to differences in socioeconomic status. Disadvantaged students in the U.S. were two and a half times more likely to be low performers than advantaged students. Now, there was the finding that equity has improved in the U.S. since 2006, and the increase in equity can be attributed to gains in performance among disadvantaged students. However, there is a 91-point gap in science performance between students attending advantage schools and those attending disadvantage schools. So again, we're seeing within the U.S., when we focus on different subgroups, we have differing educational outcomes. And if we connect that back to the fairness dimension of equity, recall that fairness means ensuring that personal and social circumstances are not obstacles to achieving educational potential. And when it comes to the inclusion dimension, that means ensuring that everyone has a basic minimum standard of education. And as Darling Hammond suggests in her analysis of the 2003 PISA results, we are not living up to those ideals. What are the presumptions and explanations that are often used to explain these results? Well, Darling Hammond argues there's a pervasive presumption that equal educational opportunities now exist. She explains this by arguing that common explanations for differing educational outcomes blame children or their families or their communities. And what do they blame these folks for? Well, they blame them for a lack of effort, for poor child rearing, a culture of poverty, and inadequate genes. Those are some of the different reasons that have been used to explain these differing educational outcomes. However, Darling Ham encounters saying that educational outcomes for students of color are much more a function of their unequal access to key educational resources, including skilled teachers and quality curriculum. She also raises a very important point, this idea of compounding inequalities. 
And if we connect this to our illustrated metaphor, we can ask ourselves, why is the ground so uneven? And Darling Hammond explains this through the concept of compounding inequalities. What are those inequalities? Well, within the United States, the ground is uneven because of 200 years of slavery, 100 years of court-sanctioned discrimination based on race, the idea of separate but equal, and then 50 years of differential access to education as determined by race, class, language background, and geographical location. And quite powerfully, she argues that 50 years after Brown v. Board of Education, the gaps in educational achievement between white and non-Asian minority students remained large. And, and here's the big point, the differences in access to educational opportunities are growing. They're not shrinking, they're growing. A question I have for all of you is, what role do you think technology has played in those growing differences in access to educational opportunity. Now I want to talk about Carter and Wellner's book, Closing the Opportunity Gap. And importantly, they introduce a couple of key concepts. And one of those concepts is the difference between the achievement gap and the opportunity gap. So let's delve into that distinction. Now Carter and Wellner write that opportunity and achievement are very different goals. On the one hand, the achievement gap focuses on significant differences in school results between groups based on measured outcomes, such as test scores and graduation rates. The 2003 PISA results that we were just looking at, as well as the 2015 PISA results that I shared, are examples of focusing on achievement gaps, significant differences in different groups in terms of outcomes. Now, in contrast, the opportunity gap shifts our attention from outcomes to inputs. In other words, it's not about what comes out of the education system, but what goes into the inputs into the education system. The opportunity gap focuses on the deficiencies in the foundational components of societies, schools, and communities that produce significant differences in educational and ultimately socioeconomic outcomes. A convenient way to think about it is thinking in terms of achievement gaps emphasizes the symptoms, whereas thinking about opportunity gaps highlights the causes of those symptoms. Now, framing education in this light reveals the idea that the achievement gap is a predictable result of systemic causes. The achievement gap is a representation of the disparities and opportunities available to children of different racial, ethnic, socioeconomic, and cultural backgrounds. So, I want to come back to our shape-shifting illustrated metaphor. And I want to ask the question, what is the game? Now, I know many of you wrestled with this in your critical reflections. And I know many of you realize that the more we think about this metaphor, the more complicated it becomes. And that's why I jokingly refer to it as a shape-shifting metaphor. But what I want to posit right now is that the game represents participation in today's information society. The participants behind the fence here have different levels of opportunity when it comes to participating in the information society. So what is the information society? Well, it's been defined as a social system greatly dependent on information technologies to produce and distribute all manner of goods and services. It is sometimes called the information age or the knowledge economy, and the information society relies on computer technologies to augment mental labor. And this is in contrast to the industrial society, which relied on the internal combustion engine to augment human physical labor. So we're seeing the information society is bringing about a change, a shift in priority from physical labor to mental labor. And it is changing the way we live, how we work and do business, how we educate our children, study and do research, how we train ourselves, as well as how we are entertained. So the information society is having a drastic impact on all aspects of life. 
So one of the things that we need to think about when contemplating the social and ethical issues related to educational technology is we have to think about the future of jobs in the U.S. and around the world. Some researchers have argued that there are five skill categories, and these skill categories range from routine jobs, which can either be manual or cognitive, to non-routine manual jobs, such as preparing a meal, to non-routine, abstract, analytical, and interpersonal work. Now the question is, what are the trends in the demands for those different kinds of skills? Well, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development has been tracking the demand for those different types of skills over time. And as you can see here in Germany, in the United States, and in Japan, routine manual and routine cognitive skills are dropping off. However, what's increasing are the non-routine jobs, in particular the non-routine interactive work, the interpersonal, and the non-routine analytical work. We're seeing huge spikes in that non-routine type of work, which really puts a premium on people's ability to solve problems in the modern world. So an essential question for us is how can we leverage technology to improve students' problem-solving abilities, given that that is the skill that is going to be in demand as we move further into the 21st century. Now let's connect that back around to the idea of leveraging technology to transform learning. And what I want to share here is just some of the areas of significant progress that were reported in the 2017 National Education Technology Plan. Now I won't read through all of these, but I do want to highlight a couple of them. So one of them is that the conversation has shifted from whether technology should be used in learning to how technology can improve learning to ensure that all students have access to high quality educational experiences. So that's one significant area of progress. Another one is this idea that sophisticated software has begun to allow us to adapt assessments and instruction to the needs and abilities of individual learners and provide near real-time results. And a third area of significant progress is that the cost of digital devices has decreased dramatically while computing power has increased along with the availability of high quality interactive educational tools and apps. Now, let's step back from those three areas of significant progress and let's put on our nature of technology hats. And let's question these for a moment. Do we really think that sophisticated software has begun to allow us to adapt assessments and instruction to the needs and abilities of individual learners and provide near real-time results? Think of your education experiences or the schools that you work in. Are you seeing evidence of sophisticated software? Are you seeing evidence of adaptive assessments and instruction? Are you seeing the provision of near real-time results to educators and or administrators? Now, I don't want to be too cynical, but I would argue that we have a lot of room to grow there. And I would also remind all of us that this type of sophisticated software is likely a Faustian bargain. Some things will be gained, but other things will be lost. And I want to connect what can be gained and what can be lost back to the two dimensions of equity and education, fairness and inclusion. Is it possible that there will continue to be unexpected consequences to further integration of technology in education? Let's end on that question. We're out of time for today. Have a great week and I'll see you in Canvas.